He brought James the classic, classic. All the inspiration. The third, the panelist, uh, and I got permission from Professor Kubo, and I can uh, simplify to uh, Professor TJ. Okay. And then uh, the fourth, uh, and it's a very cherished uh, uh, our lady, uh, 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 Professor V. Victor Green. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to um, the, the express my great gratitude for all the organizers and uh, participants of this conference. And uh, I will not use a PowerPoint, so probably many of you uh, are in asleep. But uh, um, probably my presentation is related to the history about 70 years ago. Uh, but probably also could give uh, some hints uh, in order to understand the contemporary issues as well. I will start. How the <coughs> defeated side innovates their politics by recognizing the failure of former regimes? One answer could be gained from a comparative study in the worldwide context. For example, the biggest difference between the formation of constitution in Japan and other Asian countries is that Japan had to overcome its aggressive past of the previous regime. To prevail over tyranny, it is valuable to compare Japan with other Axis powers such as Italy and Germany rather than with Asian countries. The purpose of this presentation is to compare the formation of constitutions to the experience of Japan, Italy, and Germany after the defeat of the Second World War. I focus on the similarities and dissimilarities among the three Axis powers and analyze how and why they faced the problems associated with the constitutional one different. In the Italian constitution, Article 1 states that the Republic is founded on the basis of labor, since the workers suffered most during the fascist period. In Germany's basic law, Article 1 underlines human rights for the purpose of getting older the Nazi past, that the people should be protected from the, the oppression of the state. In the Japanese constitution, Article 9 confirmed the emperor as a symbol of state, despite the foreign power rests with the people. The aggression under the name of emperor should never be repeated. Therefore, Article 9, the abolition of war, was necessary to carry on the emperor system in Japan. Regarding the influence of occupation forces, they faced similar problems, but in the different state of affairs. After the ferocious war, on common ground, it was clearly recognized that the people should no longer sacrifice their individual happiness for the sake of the state. Notwithstanding Anglo-American intervention, holding a plebiscite and a general election in June 1946, the Italian people chose the Republic and elected representatives of the Constituent Assembly to form the popular government instead of the pre-war monarchy and oligarchy. While in Germany, a federal system and a constitutional court were introduced on account of an American model, 
more than in Italy and Japan. The initiative of each land in West Germany saved democracy from ruin by drawing out its own state constitution. Most of Japanese politicians were so eager in protection of the emperor that they did not raise a fundamental objection to the draft of the general headquarters, so-called GHQ, of American occupational force. However, many conservative politicians, even today, maintain that the present constitution is American and not Japanese. The similarities among the pre-war regimes concern ideology and perception of war in fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, and outer nationalist Japan. One of the prominent features shared among the three Axis powers was racism, in that each race claimed itself to be homogeneous, pure, and superior. Social Darwinism, interpreted as a racial struggle for survival, motivated and justified all three nations in their attempt to conquer inferior races. Of course, white racism in Germany and Italy was different from the Japanese superiority complex in the Asian family, whose biggest brother, namely Japan, should punish its ill-behaved younger brother, such as Korea and China. Nevertheless, one could not draw a clear distinction between a hierarchy of races and the Japanese standpoint discriminating the other imperial nations. Although there existed many types of racism, Nazi racism was so extraordinary that the outbreak of war against the Soviet Union in June 1941 accelerated the degree of intolerance and the tempo of genocide. For the sake of amending a racist disregard for human rights, the drafters of the basic law had to include a very extensive and detailed view of rights, which was adopted as the opening 19 articles. It was for the first time in the history of German constitutions to use the word human rights mentioned in the articles. Moreover, Article 1 clearly declared the state is obliged to respect and to protect human dignity. The Japanese emp uh, emp Empire utilized the notion of color against white races to account for its expansion into neighboring countries. The Japanese inferiority complex towards the West also fueled its heavy-handed attitude and coercive measures against the Asian people. The Japanese soldiers also lived by plunder from the Chinese population because they were forced to bear hunger and deprivation caused by insufficient logistic support on many occasions. Those who survived on the battlefield and returned to Japan sold of themselves as war victims. The Japanese, unconscious of war responsibility, easily accepted Article 1 to recognize the emperor as a symbol of the people and peace. However, in order to avoid any future calamity, it was natural for many Japanese to support Article 9, the renunciation of war, since the war was an outcome of Japanese militarism, which had also tormented the Japanese people themselves. The three Axis powers shared a common ideological background, racism, but each racism accelerated 
is cruel oppression and aggression in a different manner. The finer shades of meaning cause their peculiar problems of the regimes, which also created unique ideas of their post-war constitutions relating to their first articles. The way of defeat uh, exerted a great influence on the constitution-making process. There is a strong resemblance in their perception among the three Axis powers regarding to whom they lost. In the whole course of the war, Italy was defeated by Greece, Yugoslavia, and Britain. Germany was beaten by the Soviet Union. Japan broke down in the mark of the war against China. Nonetheless, most of the conservative politicians in Italy, Germany, and Japan were eager to think that they had only lost the war against the United States, which are the strongest power in the world and which would become their protector after the war. This signifies complex repercussions which the United States had on the defeated countries. Japan ended the war on 15th August 1945 with fierce aerial bomb bombardment, including the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki by atomic bombs. Nevertheless, their enemies were invisible until the occupation. Thus, many Japanese felt as if the war had been no more than a natural dis disaster. After General MacArthur warned the Japanese government that the Far Eastern Commission, which met in Washington, D.C., was likely to be very tough when considering the position of the emperor. The government changed their stance and tried to create a new constitution as quickly as possible. Because the other victorious countries aired their opinions that the Emperor Hiroshito should be accused before the International Tribunal for the Far East. For the purpose of defending the Emperor, even giving up its colonies, Japan spent only about a year amending the constitution, fastest among the three defeated countries. How each country ended its war affected the process of constitution making as well as its content. As Japan did not experience the fierce ground operation in its homeland, except Okinawa, no strong resistance movements occurred in Italy and Germany. The Japanese political leaders were very conscious of their war responsibility, especially as aggressors. Moreover, as a consequence of making the emperor to evade his political responsibility, no one took the blame for injustice during the war. The post-war constitution is often said to be imposed. Even so, the same type of arguments about allied influence can also be applied to Italy and especially to Germany. It is interesting to note the existence of correlation between the resistance put up against the pre-war regime before its defeat and the protests that grew against the intervention of occupation forces, even after the war. On the other hand, the Japanese government was informed in February 1946, after its holding population, the Supreme Commander will take the Constitution to the people directly and make it a live issue in the forthcoming campaign in order that the people will have the opportunity to enact 
this constitution. However, the Japanese cabinet members feared that once the GHQ draft had been published, the people would easily be influenced by leftist propaganda, which could end in the abolition of national authority, that means uh, emperor system. Most politicians therefore decided to accept the draft rather than to resist the American intervention by appealing for democracy as the Germans did. Finally, yet importantly, there is a criticism against Article 9, the capstone of the peace constitution, that it is too idealistic. However, as mentioned above, all three constitutions have their own ideals, which made a clean break with the pre-war oppressive regimes for the purpose of surpassing their past experiences. They had to contribute new ideas to the constitutions, which sometimes were criticized as unrealistic. At the time of resistance, Although very few Europeans could also believe that the dream of the European Union would come true, they thought it is insufficient to restore the previous national sovereignties after the fall of tyrannical governments. In order to solve the problem of coexistence in peace and the freedom in Europe, together with Germany, both in Italy and in Germany after the war. Each constitution contained a separate article proclaiming the transfer of state power to the supranational organization. Unlike Europe, in Asia, no regional framework could be established because of the Cold War and the absence of Japanese sincere apology for the Second World War. Despite the fact that there still exists a gap between reality and the ideas of EU or Article 9, after the defeat of, uh, after the defeat, Italy, Germany, and Japan had to overcome the temptation of limiting their citizens' freedoms and rights with the aim of recreating the free war system of a state prepared for total war. Avoiding any reversion to their undemocratic and militaristic predecessors, the ideas of the three constitutions should be embedded in the hearts of the people. This is the end.
very often journalists ask me a question, what do you think about today's relation between Croatia and Serbia? And uh, of course the answer depends on uh, who are you thinking of. For example, if you are thinking about political elites and politicians, uh, these relations uh, look like the war, is, the war will become, begin tomorrow. But if you look on the uh, level of uh, intellectuals, businessmen, scientists, actors, singers, ordinary people, then I think that uh, from 90s today, uh, the <coughs> relations are better and better from year to year. So it's very interesting. History is one of the main instability factors in these relations. And it's also very interesting to, to stress that uh, Croats and Serbs are living together, one close to other, for centuries. And mainly in peace and coexistence. Only for few years during the 20th century they were uh, in war and in some kind of hostility. Uh, but today when we are dealing with the uh, Croatian-Serbian history, uh, we are mainly dealing with, with few periods and I just put few uh, key years. So 1918 as the founding of, of the first Yugoslavia. So first state where Croats and Serbs from Serbia uh, begin their common uh, living in, in, in common state. Uh, 1941 as the collapse of First Yugoslavia and the founding of uh, puppet fascist state, independent state of Croatia. 1945 as the founding year of uh, Second Yugoslavia. 1991 as a year of collapse of uh, Second Yugoslavia and uh, founding of independent state and beginning of war, the last war so far, and 1995 as the end of war. This period of 70 or 80 years was marked with, uh, in the, sometimes in the same time, but also uh, depending on the period, with inequality, with war, with ethnic cleansing, with genocide, but also with coexistence, with brotherhood and unity, as a phrase, with coexistence, with mixed marriages, and so on and so on. So, uh, before I mention something about dealing with the past and problems with the past today, just to, to uh, go back to, to the history of Yugoslavia. Dealing with the past or past history in Yugoslavia, in socialist Yugoslavia was very, very uh, important uh, uh, part of, of society. So anti-fascism, partisan resistance, communism were only present in politics, in school system, in everyday life, in different ways. Uh, historiography was ideological, selective and tendentious and of course there was because of all that there was just or only one historical narrative with good and bad guys with black and white approach and the goal was glorification of Yugoslavia and demonization especially of uh, collaboration even more than uh, uh, Germans and uh, Nazi Germans and fascists uh, uh, from, from Italy. What is very, uh, very important to, to understand when we, uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, problems in Croatia with revisionism for the last uh, three decades is the next slide. So, in synchrony with this narrative, there was a uh, totally opposite nar uh, narrative on the same period uh, in uh, Croatian emigration, so you maybe most of you know that uh, in 1945 uh, thousands of uh, supporters of the regime escaped, like Nazis, escaped 
from Europe to South America, to North America, to Australia, Europe, and uh, whatever. So, in uh, these organizations in immigration, uh, uh, they also uh, uh, took care about the narrative. And uh, when you look on, and compare with the, the, uh, uh, the slide I showed you, uh, also the historiography was ideological, tendentious, and selective, but totally different because uh, they were also good and bad guys, but those who were bad in uh, Yugoslavia were good here, and those who were uh, 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 bad were good and so on. So uh, the goal also was now glorification of Croatian state and statehood and demonization of communist Yugoslavia. It's, it, it is not something uh, un uh, uncomparable or something totally unique, but what, what is unique, what happened in the 90s? Because if you go to Paraguay or Argentina, you will find some uh, Nazi uh, communes, Nazi uh, uh, societies, where they are, of course, talking about Hitler as uh, God and the Third Reich as uh, uh, the best period of German history. But what never happened is that uh, that narrative came to Europe 70 years later and uh, became equal, let's say equal, to the uh, official narrative. That happened in, in Croatia in the 90s. So uh, when, when we start with the uh, uh, democratization and uh, with uh, uh, independence, uh, of course, that uh, it was necessary to reevaluate uh, uh, narratives of history. But if you're, if, if there was some somebody from outside of uh, Croatia and looked on the uh, things in Croatia in the 90s, he would say that uh, everything will be totally okay because the first president of Croatia was ex-partisan and ex-communist and uh, anti-fascism was introduced in the constitution and the public holiday uh, for the first time uh, be uh, became day of anti-fascistic struggle. But uh, on the other hand, uh, influence uh, of political immigrants and political prisoners, uh, mainly anti-communists, uh, arrived. And uh, really important uh, uh, factor was on dealing with the past was war for independence or homeland war, no Rat. And why is that important? Because from that moment, uh, uh, talking about Yugoslavia, about the Yugoslav people army, a successor of a partisan army and communism, they were uh, overviewed through the 90s. So the, the way uh, Croatia uh, uh, exit Yugoslavia was uh, the, the basis to, uh, uh, to talk and think about Yugoslavia and uh, uh, all connected with Yugoslavia in all periods. So, uh, so in theory, everything uh, looked okay, but then in practice you have some, I will give you just a few quotes from very, very important persons in that period, like president of state, like president of parliament, and some other uh, guys. You can see uh, uh, revisionism, you can see even uh, anti-Semitism, and uh, so on. Uh, also, you can see, for example, this is photo with to you maybe totally unknown persons, but in the in the center is the son-in-law of Ante Pavelic, uh, Pogodnik of the independent state of Croatia, uh, who was prominent figure in uh, Croatian immigration. And in the 90s, he gathered young guys from Croatia, and the guy you can see down with glasses uh, two years ago was Minister of Culture of Croatia. And the guy uh, from his right is one of the, uh, let's say, very popular journalists today in, in Croatia. So they were uh, uh, together writing in the newspapers, uh, pro Ustasha, very pro Ustasha. Or uh, the role of the church, this is one of those who, 
who were pro Stasha uh, or uh, guy who was uh, one of the signatory of racial laws, got his, uh, the name on the street, or there are many examples, for example, like this is from the from last year, a panel discussion about Yasenovats as a false myth, uh, so uh, concentration camp Yasenovats. So, uh, in practice also, uh, 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 it was not dealing with the past, but fighting with the past. Uh, uh, almost more than 3,000 uh, monuments uh, dedicated to anti-fascist struggle and victims of fascism were destroyed uh, in 10 years in the in 90s. Almost 3 million books uh, were destroyed or were removed from Croatian libraries because they were on Cyrillic or they were about anti-fascism, about Tito or about Yugoslavia. Uh, names uh, on, of anti-fascist parts and heroes were abolished and some Pustasha politicians and war heroes uh, got their names. Uh, how, how did it look on, on the field? This is from my hometown where, where first uh, anti-fascist squad was founded in 1941. This was uh, the monument uprising. In 1991 it was destroyed with the dynamite and so you can see the empty uh, space. Or, for example, this is the, maybe the most, uh, one of the most famous monuments at that, uh, at that time in the world, uh, Wojn Bakic. Uh, one, at that moment it was the, the highest um, uh, uh, has monument, abstract monument in the world dedicated to anti-fascism. In 1941, it was destroyed by uh, Croatian army. Or, for example, this is a list of uh, this is a, a one table in, in my high school uh, with a list of uh, students who uh, died in World War II as partisans. Uh, you can see the empty wall. Uh, or, for example, monument to uh, partisans. <laughs> and it was destroyed and the cross uh, is right now at that place. So, I will just give you a few uh, quick uh, uh, words about the role of history education in the 90s. Uh, so, of course, during the, the, the democratization, we were all thinking that uh, history education should prepare students for citizenship, help them build an open democratic society, and prepare for multi-ethnic and multicultural society, but on the contrary, the role of history education in Croatia became awakening of emotions of loyalty, promoting national identity, encouraged patriotism, and uh, Croatian state uh, became main purpose and outcome of all historical development. Uh, one of our uh, Serbian colleague, Dubrovka Kostojanovic, once said that history textbooks are weapons of mass instruction in the battle to define national identity. <coughs> Uh, this is a quote from one uh, church journal in Croatia that the textbook must be written from the Croatian standpoint and it must present Croatian truths. Um, so, uh, goals, uh, which, is connected, which is connected with, with Croatian Serbian relations, uh, now to, uh, to, to show not similarity, solidarity, unity with uh, other South Slavs but stressing differences, especially with Serbs, uh, and eradicate the legacy of Yugoslav system, and uh, relativize uh, the Ustasha regime uh, period. Um, I will give you just a few examples, for example, about the World War II, uh, when there is a one sentence about Ustasha regime, uh, we, you can see this relativization that Ustasha following the racist policies of Nazi Germany have been committed crimes of genocide uh, as well uh, uh, against Jews and Gypsies as well against Serbs especially because of their former hegemonic policies uh, number only about Croatian victims during the war not about Serbs, Roma, Jews uh, also during the socialist period you can see the titles in, in the textbook in, uh, in elementary and secondary school uh, Yugoslavia was Serbo-Slavia, Serbs were more equal than Croats, regime was Serbanized, and so on. And of course, the most sensitive 
topic uh, uh, is still and was common war about the character of war. It's in, in Croatian textbook, it's only Serbian aggression. And uh, uh, when talking about the victims, there can only be Croatian victims and Serbian perpetrators, only one true, only one perspective. So, to conclude with the last slide, uh, where are we now? Uh, history versus future. So, uh, still we have a very, very strong state control under historical narrative uh, or truth. And history education, we got a lack of democracy in, so in society total and in the educational system, lack of multi perspectivity, lack of critical thinking again in society and in schools. And of course, what is really important, what is not only connected with the situation in Croatia, uh, the rise of right or far right, not only in Croatia, but in, in, uh, in Europe and in, uh, in the world, with this historical revisionism. So uh, there is uh, 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 still uh, a huge struggle uh, for history and uh, what is more important for our present and future. Thank you.
Serbia, when the city of Obrenovac, not that far from uh, uh, Belgrade, was uh, covered with water. Um, the only thing I remember from one of uh, uh, the highest position priests in, uh, within the Serbian Orthodox Church was that he said that God obviously still loves the Serbs, therefore the flood was sent, you know, for them to uh, refresh the, the true belief in, uh, in the Bible and the word of God, you know, that that was uh, just a warning to the Serbs how they <coughs> should actually live on this uh, world. If you have that kind of uh, a church and hierarchy, I think that we can then rather talk about national churches or nationalisms within uh, that part of uh, or element of the society. And nationalism is something that you can detect uh, everywhere, I would say. So uh, we can talk uh, about nationalism in the way how we handle the past and in the way how we uh, uh, educate our kids and so on. That lead us, leads us to another problem I guess both countries share. And that is, they are undereducated. Uh, when you look at the number of people with high school and elementary and uh, special university uh, uh, diplomas, then uh, Croatia is uh, very behind uh, within the European Union. Um, but it's still uh, ahead of uh, Serbia, meaning that both countries are at the end uh, 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 in Europe. Um, you have an obsession with the past. We've heard something uh, about that. Uh, but the way how past is being handled and how past is important in uh, both of our societies, uh, in a very unhealthy way, uh, more important than anything that's going on right now in the society, and still with a potential to win the elections, if you are talking about the past, that, in my opinion, cannot be very uh, healthy, and especially if you are tackling the past in the way uh, as it's been tackled here. So where is Croatia uh, geographical? Is it is part of the European Union? That's fine. Is it part of uh, Central Europe? Uh, many Croatians or many political Croatians would like it to be only part of Central Europe, period, nothing more than that. But if you want to cross the border between Croatia and two countries that are even more part of Central Europe, like Hungary and uh, Slovenia, you will um, see that uh, there are a very serious border uh, uh, installations at uh, uh, the border between Slovenia and Croatia and Croatia and Hungary, uh, erected a couple of years ago to prevent the movement of the refugees uh, coming from the Middle East Africa. Um, so Croatia is uh, not willing to say that it, it shares anything with the Balkans, Croatia not being part of the Balkans, but also divided from Central Europe by uh, the wire, uh, which is uh, like a wire in some of the concentration camps uh, 70 something years ago. Uh, the population. Both countries are facing a very serious problem. Uh, many of uh, countries in the eastern part of Europe uh, went through that. Uh, the levels are very dangerous, I, I can say. Um, and uh, if Croatia doesn't do anything, by uh, 2050, 55, we will probably have half a million, two million people less than we have right now. But it's very serious. Uh, Croatia has been independent for 26 years. Uh, we joined the European Union but did not become a state of law. We joined the European Union but we did not, did not eradicate corruption on the contrary. We are so behind and our industry has been destroyed, uh, and we are still not doing very well. We do not have any trust in our institutions. Uh, Croatia managed to uh, liberate every part of its territory, but however, and nevertheless, 
we have unsolved border issues with all of our neighbors, save for Hungary, that's a little bit older than uh, uh, the border one. Croatia is not a member, is not a country where we can talk about meritocracy. But it is more important to have a connection or maybe a party uh, affiliation in order to advance. It's very hard to conduct any kind of reform. Uh, we have over 555 <coughs> local districts in Croatia. It would be a great reform to be able to return to a number of local districts we used to have during the Tito's time, and that was 127. Now that seems as uh, this you know, mission impossible. And you have several segments within the population that are facing different type of uh, discrimination, although some advances uh, have been made. If I'm talking, or if I can say something about Serbia, a country I know less well, uh, I think that no one will actually contradict me and say that this country became uh, a country uh, where the rule of law is obeyed, where party affiliation is not important, where meritocracy is power of the day, uh, where people are, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, prospering because the economy is working well. There are, there are a few more problems, uh, problems Croatia doesn't have, and that is uh, that we do not know the exact borders of uh, Serbia still, uh, or at least people in Serbia do not know what the, the uh, actual borders uh, are. Uh, What's been good over the past 25 years? Uh, some people who know a little bit about Croatia might say that your roads are very good. That's true. We managed to build very many uh, uh, kilometers of uh, excellent highways. But I'm uh, not so convinced that that is really something, because if you spend some other's money, or money you do not have, so that you get, that's very easy. And you can build wonderful uh, things, but that's not really Tourism uh, uh, works, maybe, uh, and that is the only hope uh, I have, although you cannot become rich just thanks to tourism. But tourism, in spite of being so important, and in spite of being so, uh, uh, so lucrative for, for the country, uh, is probably the, the least politicized segment of our economy, which gives some hope. That it's possible to develop something that we don't find in, in other areas. And you have soccer or sports in general. Sports you can find in Serbia also. Uh, sometimes it's uh, more of an individual uh, level, sometimes more collective, but uh, it's never part of a system. Um, but maybe talent, which is somewhere. So, okay, if the situation is as dark as uh, the situation I just have described, um, could we actually even hope for establishing or establishing those relations? Maybe not. Maybe you know, nationalism, if everybody talks about nationalism, if, 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 hatred, if hatred is uh, 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 pushed everywhere, and if that's important to, to win in the elections, uh, then maybe it's not very easy to talk about uh, uh, the peaceful future. But at the same time, there are so many countries uh, in other parts of the world uh, that are <coughs> uh, that, that can be backward and poor, but the relations do not have to be extremely uh, uh, unfriendly. You know. We have to find something that might be in the interest of both countries. In the interest, when I say in the interest, that doesn't mean that uh, you can count that uh, people in Serbia are still going to uh, take Croatian chocolates and that people in Croatia are going to take um, the chocolate spread for pancakes as the one we had this morning, you know, being produced in Serbia. That's not enough. We have to find something uh, uh, more uh, reliable and something more important. Uh, could European values be uh, in that. Could we maybe join or be together in uh, 
within the European Union and then say, well, that's what they do on it. Uh, some 10 years ago, I was maybe thinking about that. Now, in the light of everything that's going on in uh, Poland, uh, Hungary, some other parts of Europe, uh, where Croatia was for half a year in 2016, I'm not sure that we can do that alone, or that European pressure might be uh, uh, strong enough to, to find a common denominator. So, uh, I will uh, conclude here, leaving this open, uh, hoping that there is something that might connect us. But uh, I'd say that I don't see very many things. However, maybe, and that's a quote uh, by husband of Dubravka Stojanovic, who, who, who was mentioned in the previous uh, uh, lecture, uh, Ivan Cholovic, who recently in Zagreb said, let us hate each other as human beings, not as serfs and brats. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, 
region and Eastern Europe in on the beginning of the 18th century. Uh, the Battle of Moldova cannot be taken from Russia's history without uh, causing significant damage uh, to uh, the existing historical narrative. Actually, Moldova 1709 is the foundation myth for Rus Russian imperial history. And modern Russian myth about the Battle of Poltava is placed into the context of the military conquests of Peter the First tribe. The struggle for geopolitical interests of the Russian Empire in the Baltic Sea elevated to the level of necessity. Only the Russian Empire and Kingdom of Sweden is named amongst the political actors. And Ukrainian, early modern Ukrainian ruler and former friend of Peter the Great, who suddenly changed sides and joined, joined Swedish army, Ivan Mazepa, is mentioned as a, a traitor. Generally, the Battle of Poltava is interpreted in Russian historical narrative as one of the most profound parts of the success story of the Russian imperial power. Um, on the other hand, from uh, the perspective of Ukrainian national narrative, this battle marks uh, Russia as political other and enemy of Ukraine. It opens up to possibility, uh, the possibility to promote the early modern Ukrainian ruler Ivan Mazepa as a national hero and symbolical figure of resistance against Russian imperialism. Actually, in uh, the Ukrainian version of this myth, the emphasis, uh, emphasis is shifted from the battle itself mm -hmm. to uh, the role of Ivan Mazepa as a leader. Therefore, it is important to find out uh, whether the, those two myths about the battle are functioning in modern Ukrainian and Russian societies or not. And if so, if they are functioning, what is their place and role taking into account the ongoing Russian-Ukrainian war. And maybe a more important issue is to analyze how public debate about the Poltava battle, 1709, can be a pretext for identifying those political, economic and social realities whose existence is not limited to the present-day conflict, but, but which are crucial in our understanding of the current state of Ukrainian society influenced by war. Uh, to add some context, uh, let me run a few years ago before the Russian-Ukrainian military conflict started. The last time uh, when uh, the events of the Battle of Poltava were raised at the Russian-Ukrainian level, was the anniversary of the battle in 2009. The events on the eve of the uh, third century of the battle showed an existence of conflict between Ukraine and Russia official positions about the Battle of Tupac. In May 2009, the Russian Foreign Ministry uh, issued a statement. Uh, not about the Poltava itself, but about the figure of Ivan Mazepa. The statement was about an um, attempt to rehabilitate Mazepa, in particular by renaming the street in Kyiv on, on his behalf, building his monuments in cities in Poltava and Kyiv and so on. The State Duma of Russia joined the statement as well as the official uh, Russian newspapers. The Kievan authorities tried to avoid shifting the conflict from uh, to an open phase, and as a result, the Jubilee of the third century was not commemorated on a higher international political level. Instead, it was downgraded to an event of a secondary importance. Also, uh, heated public discussions took place on the local level. For example, the argument most often heard in Poltava about Mazepa monument that was planned to open in 2009 sounds like that, which should 
tradition of first century of the Battle of Poltava didn't prevent not non Russian Cossack organizations from marching through the city in a column with a, hundred, a few hundred participants, uh, nor holding by them the Russian flag and the uh, scarecrow uh, of the traitor Mazepa, as they uh, named him. Uh, but political views of ex Major Matkovsky and present day Major Mamai look like, looks like uh, not the instant political views, but like um, being turning in different directions with wind. So six years ago, present day Major of Poltava, then a member of political party of the president escaper Yanukovych, used different arguments to prevent the installation of a monument to Mazepa in Poltava. Uh, because, on his opinion, it could uh, have damaged his relations with Kievan authorities. But two years after the beginning of the military conflict in Donbass in May 2016, the monument to Mazepa was opened, um, and the, I should find it, um, this is this monument. So in 2016, this monument was opened, and during the voting process, the former and the current measures voted also for it. So for political elites, a political mimicry is a characteristic feature that allows to change their political positions situationally. Local political actors in Poltava actually created a peculiar identity market. The laws of this market subordinated to the authoritarian principles of political electoral profit and different identity claims used as an instrument for obtaining political and economic preferences for local political leaders. So, um, after 2014, uh, we made attempts also to rethink the urban environment in the city. And these attempts are also interesting. So, um, every city could be read as a text. For Poltava, this text was an ambiguous name, and it's, 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 this name is the Battle of Poltava. Actually, Poltava is, is itself, as a city, was, uh, was rebuilt in, on the beginning of the 19th century as one great monument to that battle. Uh, since spring 2014, the beginning of war in Ukrainian Russian border region of Donbass, Ukrainian activists began to produce different ideas how to shift an emphasis in uh, the self presentation of the city. In order to respond to the challenges of Russian Ukrainian war in symbolical space. Uh, for example, it was produced, um, it was produced, it was proposed to install a monument in memory of medieval battle between the Grand Duke of Lithuania, Vitont, and troops of the Golden Horde that was held not far from Poltava in the end of 14th century. However, this significant historical event is even more distant in the past than though it was symbolically, it is not strong enough, so it didn't work. Uh, the Soviet America, uh, another attempt to made, uh, the Soviet American military operation Frantic that was in Poltava during the Second World War also mentioned as an alternative uh, military connected uh, kind of event uh, also um, partly held in Poltava. As for the commemoration of the battle, uh, the majority of Poltava residents, uh, both before and after 2014, expressed their opinions in favor too of commemoration, the battle of Poltava. But uh, here lies perhaps the most interesting moment, and I would like to stop on it. Because 
students used the anniversary of the battle to attract attention to much more important issues of economic life of the city and the region. On the road leading uh, from the city of Poltava um, to the Poltava battlefield, the protesters blocked all the transport, demanding to repair this and other destroyed roads urgently. This, so to say, unimportant attitude to a theoretically quite influential topic for Russian and Ukrainian history is very revealing. It is, I would say, quite uh, similar to the situation with well-known uh, uh, legis uh, legislations on uh, decriminalization adopted in the context of the Russian-Ukrainian war in 2014. In order to symbolically distinguish Ukraine and Russia as clearly as possible. In the framework of this law, a renaming and various eponymic objects were, uh, was uh, re required. However, when it came to implementing these laws on the, uh, on the ground, it turned out that uh, the main issues of concern to ordinary Ukrainians were not these laws and not remain in the streets, but a matter of the funds needed for the production of new plates with names of streets, and the cost of changing documents with new addresses. So quite, uh, uh, quite simple things. I guess that the last point I would stress that uh, the Poltava myth uh, has been used uh, when some important dates, uh, like the third century of the events, were approaching. However, it's worth mentioning that the history of, of the Poltava battle occupies the second place among all Ukrainian topics in Russian history in Russian school uh, textbooks. So uh, I guess that uh, this battle is still has a potential uh, for uh, political mobilization uh, when it comes to neo-imperial aspirations of some part of the Russian elites. And this battle might be used in this way. And uh, in the last, I would, uh, I would like to uh, go, uh, have some fun. <laughs> and uh, you can see on these pictures uh, how, um, how actually Voltava looks like a monument to this battle. Uh, here you can see the monument uh, to the victory of Russian army over Swedes with uh, uh, the Russian eagle holding um, the victorious, victorious um, so uh, then you can see uh, the other monument where uh, mythically, it is, it is not uh, sure, but mythically Peter the first stopped. The other monument to die <coughs> uh, Russian Empire soldiers. Uh, the other mo monument to Swedes. Uh, so um, this museum and monument to Peter the first to Mazepa. And it is a of reconciliation and uh, some pictures from local museum. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for all excellent presentations. When we talk about the past, the topic is always very interesting and sometimes also very heavy. <laughs> so now I'm going to invite uh, our discussant, the Professor Ponyo, uh, to share that with Thank you very much, and dear colleagues, uh, it was a great pleasure uh, listening to your talks, and I would also like to start, of course, with uh, thanking my colleague and friend, Pilici, for inviting me here, because, you know, it's really great to be at the kind of Japanese conference in Serbia, like, finally, with the well paid, so that's uh, something, like, you know, I told everyone in Germany, and my colleagues, you know, it was fascinating about the very idea having such a wind, you know, in such a place. And of course, Brandre is a good place for sure to talk about, uh, let's say, history and uh, complexities and its usages in all possible ways. Okay, so let me maybe make some comments. Uh, first of all, thank you very, very much, uh, dear Professor Ishida, for your, I would say, perfect example of historical and contextualization of the kind of legal issue, yeah, the writing of the Constitution, of uh, three countries after the Second World War. And uh, I also, I was, uh, it was very interesting for me, maybe not quite surprising, but very interesting 
to hear about the external factor, this entire story, and this uh, kind of idea of American influence, yeah, on what happened in the text of all the constitutions. And you know, listening to you, I've been thinking that, at least in Germany, where I happen to live for, for the couple of last years, one could easily feel kind of deep anti American complex, at least in the part of German society. And this complex, in my view, could even explain some electoral tendencies in Germany, or some attitudes of the German society towards the ones in Eastern Europe, if you wish. So, my question would be could you maybe tell us something about uh, kind of comparable phenomena in Italy and Japan? Not just in the text of constitution, but in, say, in public life and political life. Because I, th I think it's very important to understand also what's going on now in all those countries with the difficult kind of Nazi or pro-Nazi past. Uh, okay, now to Croatian colleagues of us. I should tell you that when I'm listening to you and also like reading your abstract, I was really astonished that uh, quite often you could easily change uh, the word Croats into Ukrainians or Croatian to Ukraine and you have a point which is, you know, which fits perfectly. For instance, like you wrote in your abstract that in the Second World War, Second World War was a war with Croats both on the winning and the losing side. Very good. It's exactly the case of you uh, Ukrainians, or for instance about deeply divided Croatian society with unsolved history as the leading factor of division, very much the same, and so, so, so on. Of course, there are still differences. Maybe I should even mention one, just to give some feeling of it, and then a question will come. So, in case of Croatia, we have this, as you said, like public state, yeah, such a state, in case of Ukraine, there were no uh, state, it was just an underground, nationalistic, very strong, far-right underground, but still not, not no state no state recognized by Germany or other parties here. And what's really interesting that, uh, again, everything you've told, it very much reminds me of, let's say, the story of my country. And what's very interesting, because also said, actually, both of you said that despite, if I may use this term, despite, despite the gracious EU accession, the EU membership, we still have all those problems, like from corruption to you know, the religious, and also problems with the past, textbooks, writing about it, uh, destroying monuments and whatever. And frankly speaking, as you probably know, there's no surprise that in present day Ukraine, um, the European Union is kind of, maybe I would even say the last and the only hope for whatever, you know, for human rights, some better living conditions, more pluralism, and so, so on. And it's very interesting for me whether we could still, maybe, maybe not, speak of any differences, tendencies, whatever, let's say right before and also after Croatia's EU accession. Because, you know, again, my even personal experience with Poland, because I've been a student in Poland right before Poland and the EU, I could still say that this period of like waiting for the EU membership played a very decisive, important role for the internal Polish discussion about the past, about you know, Eastern politics, whatever. Now it's all gone, that's right, of course. But at least then it was kind of different. And I'm very interested about this concept dynamics in Croatia. Um, yeah, even though I'm afraid your main point is right, that we shouldn't have too much hope about the, you know, let's say, the developments in the nearest future. And maybe also, if I may, maybe you could also tell us a bit more about Serbia. Because you see, the case of Serbia is different, at least because it's not in the EU. But the past is no less tragic, of course, for sure. And maybe it makes sense exactly like to look more to those like textbooks, monuments, whatever, right here, and maybe also kind of compare it to the Croatian situation, even without optimism. Um, and finally, about Victoria's paper. So, this Montana version is very important, of course, for all of Russia and Ukraine. I was thinking, actually, listening to my colleague, whether I can say that it's kind of, to some extent, comparable to the importance of this uh, battle of, on the Kosovo field, yeah, for Serbia and Kosovo field. Maybe not, not as much, I'm not sure about it, but still it's very important. It's very important, it's well known in the literature, in, you know, like visual arts, whatever. And I think there were two very important points in the story we heard. First of all, about, it was actually called like that, 
situational memory politics. So you could have the same people, the same context, and dealing completely differently just because you know now there's a different president. So when it was Yanukovych, they were doing one thing, now it's Poroshenko, it was Bush and Kavad, that we do something else. That's really interesting because then the question is more or less like that. How how situational could you be? Is it like completely free? You could just behave, you know, any way you want, depending on the politicians um, um, yeah, in charge of the state, there are still some limits, maybe, I don't know. And the second point, maybe even more important, about this kind of difference between local and national memory. So on the national level, both in Russia and Ukraine, on top is of course an ideological symbol of the Russian imperial success, of uh, Russian military glory, of Ukrainian pro-European aspirations, because like being an ally of Sweden probably means being pro-European in the 18th century, and so on. So. And the local context is much less ideological. It's more about like bringing attention to our place. Like, look, it's from Tampa. We are not so famous, we can remember nothing else, but this big pattern happened here. And it's really amazing that actually uh, this ideological big narrative has somehow disappeared, and we have just a kind of, I don't know, tourism or whatever attraction, or at least an attempt to play it like that, or jazz festival, yeah? Okay, uh, good. And my question, if I might, to all of you, my colleagues, would be more or less like that. It's kind of partly rhetorical, but still I think it's important to ask. So I'm a historian myself, at uh, least trying to be a historian myself, and I would ask all of you, how would you define or reflect on the role of professional historians? in such situations, in Croatia, in Serbia, in Japan, in Ukraine, in Russia. So what should or could we do, and what maybe should not, and are there any you know, like rules or limits for you like, as an actress in this uh, field? And thank you very much again. against the emperor, 
then the uh, right wing Christians reacted so harshly. And the one of uh, uh, the uh, minister uh, during that time said that if that the uh, American occupation of course uh, tried to uh, accuse emperor, uh, we could just make assassination as after assassination uh, till uh, the occupation of course would leave uh, Japan. So uh, strong words uh, even the minister uh, used during the time. So uh, once American force uh, authority touched the, the, uh, the problem of the emperor, then the, everything has changed immediately. But so long as they did not touch these kind of very delicate matter, then Japanese were so obedient. It's quite interesting that the, uh, one should just think about it. And, and then the, the last your question that how we should do right now, um, it's very hard that the, on one hand, that uh, right now, as I, in my uh, the, uh, text uh, mentioned, that the, uh, many Japanese uh, conservative politicians are thinking America is the only our secured friend uh, for our defense or our prosperity. So um, such kind of uh, the anti-American feeling <coughs> is uh, not so strong in Japan, but anti-China feeling or anti-Korea feeling is so harsh right now in Japan because the last 150 years, Japan has never experienced that China is as strong as Japan. So Japanese people are so anxious about the uh, emergence of China. And even Korea is just uh, getting way better and uh, more uh, energetic. So the uh, Japanese are reacting so harshly, uh, not only the present situation, but in terms of the historical perception, <coughs> that they right now are reacting so so we have to just think about it uh, when, if we just talk about the present situation. Yeah, of course there are many similarities between the Croatia and the Ukraine because uh, Croatian homeland was in Ukraine before uh, we arrived to, to today's homeland. And you know, maybe you probably know that today in uh, Crimea, uh, there are a lot of Croatian soldiers fighting for, of course, for money and for, uh, in, in Donbass for, for, for Ukrainian side and there are a lot of Serbian fighting for Russian side. So it's very interesting. Uh, talking about the role of historians in uh, today's society, uh, I think that we, we should have more uh, scholar activists like in the United States uh, unfortunately, in Croatia, majority of our uh, uh, colleagues are silent, uh, but they are also uh, uh, on this extreme uh, uh, parts of, of this scale. There are few of us fighting with revisionism, but there are also few of those who are revisionists and they are academics. And I think that we should be more present. Uh, not only in scientific uh, books and the newspapers, in, uh, sorry, in journals, but in uh, media, in documentaries, in public discussions, in panel discussions, in, in uh, I don't know, we should be more uh, uh, close uh, to uh, ordinary people, because history is uh, one of the major uh, 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 factor of instability in society. So if you have history as instability factor, then historians should do something more than they are doing. Okay, yeah, one, one question I probably can, can cannot even start to answer, you know, to, to this, describe in more detail the situation in, in Serbia. I didn't even talk very much about the situation in Croatia. I just said or stated what, uh, what are the problems 
um, and I would say both societies. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll give just then one optimistic remark at the end. I think that we uh, should try to strengthen the European Union and European values as the only thing that is currently on the table. Uh, in, in a world that is changing and with uh, America uh, leaving the current or what's been American policy for the past uh, uh, 70 years, and uh, that world, at least for the time being, European values could be maybe our best. Thank you. 
you elaborate on one point that you had in the slide about, I don't remember what was it, multi-perspective or multi-dimension? Because I mean, tomorrow we will going to present some of our research that favors something that we call multi-teaching principle, where basically facts do not really count much in our context. And I mean, Duber Castellanos was mentioned, I was actually involved in one of the failed attempts to have a kind of common well, textbook on our wars, what happened in the wars for the US legacy. So although I also support the kind of idea, I am struggling to see how would this kind of be implemented, right? Mm -hmm. One would be kind of multi-perspective having different implementations, second would be joint one, but for both kind of options I see very very little progress because kind of personal failure in that attempt. And also what we actually found, and I don't want to steal your show, we're going to talk tomorrow, but what we found is actually that facts are not really something that can help us interpret what happened, right? Because we have our own perception of the facts in that sense. So how do you see these kind of multi multidimensional, multi-perspective, like that? Thank you. Kurt Bessiner, um, uh, University of St. Andrews. Um, my questions are also for, for like, the friends from Zagreb. Um, I, I want to throw out a provocative sense, observation, and get your reaction to it. I mean, um, do you think that the, the, the conflicts of the 1990s that we saw would have been as easily mobilized had there been another generation under the same sort of Kratzpo-Yedinspo regime? Uh, because something that I observed in Bosnia was people would come home from school and then somebody would say, well, you know, what is this shit they're teaching you in school? Let me tell you what really happened. It may have been really what happened to them, but you could extrapolate from that. And I'm just curious what, what your perspectives are. And the second is, is, is an observation of, now we're living in a European Union member state, but the common perception that I think still is on bureaucratic autopilot is, there's this sort of civilizational gradient to get into the EU, continue to move forward, there's progress. I think every post Yugoslav society uh, is probably, or at least arguably, uh, less liberal and less meritocratic now than it was 35 years ago. And I'm curious about your, your take on that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation, and I have uh, the, the common question to uh, both uh, Dr. Prasic uh, and Dr. Uh, Serkinenko. <laughs> Is it okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, actually, the both of you talk about the role of the past and the role of the, the memory of the uh, past conflict and the framing, framing them to into the contemporary to, to understand the contemporary conflict, right? Um, well, actually, the, uh, well, as, a, as a scholar of the Middle Eastern studies, well, uh, I think that subject, I mean, using the past conflict as a symbol of, 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 the, of the contemporary conflict is very, very important <coughs> to understand the conflict in the Middle East also. And, uh, uh, well, the, my question is, um, uh, well, I think most of you talk about the uh, mobilization of the past, the memory of the past, from above, I mean, the, uh, uh, for example, um, Dr. Krasic uh, mentioned about the textbook and it along with the education. So it means that it is done by the uh, done by the state. So state mobilization of the past past memory uh, uh, as a tool of the education or something like that. And also, uh, 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 Said <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, uh, maybe better to say Victoria. Uh, well, <laughs> Victoria mentioned that the, uh, the role of the uh, monument. So monument is created or uh, built by a certain authority, right? So uh, the question is, how about the uh, the, uh, the movement or uh, activity among the popular uh, among the people to revive, uh, revitalize? The past conflict, uh, past uh, the memory of the past conflict, because because in, in the Middle East there is one one scholar mentioned that there were uh, uh, in constructing the uh, past memory was there are two ways from up from the from from the upper side I mean from the state and 
same time that from the from the bottom. I mean, the, in the in the uh, uh, other society. So I want to know now how is uh, I can say a bottom up uh, uh, active, uh, uh, an attempt to uh, revitalize the past. Thank you very much for the questions. Now, uh, we suppose we have a healthy break. <laughs> 4.15, uh, I'm sorry for my misdemeanor. So I would like to invite our presenter to confine the uh, uh, response as short as possible. Thank you very much for coming. And so first of all, diaspora, it's, it's very hard to generalize because uh, like in Croatia and Serbia today, there are people who are very good friends and uh, they are connected to each other. So like in diaspora, there are pools that uh, guys, Croatians and Serbs in, in diaspora are more nationalist than those in Croatia and Serbia right now. Uh, so, uh, but you have, you, you, you need to have in mind that there are different kinds of diaspora. There are diaspora, economic diaspora, for example, in the Croatian diaspora from beginning of 20th century or in 60s, but there is also political diaspora and there's a huge difference. Uh, from those who, whose relatives were mustaches and those who, uh, whose fathers uh, went to find a job. So, there's the difference. Uh, about the common textbooks, uh, I don't think it's uh, uh, not possible, because if you ask me 10 years ago, is it possible that if policemen stop you and say that you are speeding and uh, that you would not give him 100 kunas or 20 euros to say, uh, please allow me to, to go, I would say no, it's not possible. Today in Croatia it's possible. So I think that we should do more on, on, on that. I don't think that it's, uh, it's much harder than, than to, to uh, I don't know, to, to gain a, a, a low state. So uh, multi perspectivity is the only way, not about it. So talking about different facts, talking about different stories, different destinies, I think it's, it's the only way in, in the post-conflict regions. Uh, so it was the, the well, brotherhood and unity. It's, uh, or uh, it, it, it's yeah, it's, it's very hard uh, hard to answer what what what, what should be uh, or what, uh, what what would happen if because you know it, it, there were many discussions. We were all uh, uh, rising in the same state in the same, you know, on the same values and you know one day we were uh, friends and uh, members of pioneer organization and giving oath to I don't know Tito and the uh, next day so my I was I was in war in 1991 and my first neighbor was also in the war ten, he, he went 10 kilometers from my home so he was in the Serbian let's say uh, uh, uniform I was in Croatian uniform and we became enemies right now we are again very good friends so um, and talking about uh, bo uh, uh, bottom above, no, it's 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 of course uh, th there are many family stories, and uh, in family is very very important factor in this dealing with the past. But when, when you have uh, monuments ruined by the state or uh, uh, members of uh, leading party, when you have a street named after some war criminals. Uh, when you have in the parliament declaration of the homeland war, and when you write a textbook, it should be uh, written in that uh, uh, sense. And if you uh, don't uh, uh, follow that declaration, if you are a teacher, you could have some consequences. Then it's hard to, to talk. Of course, there are uh, different approaches from, from uh, uh, bottom, but I, I think that there is. Uh, it should be a very, very strong and no, um, uh, very strong and very strict state policy uh, against uh, uh, revisionism, racism, and, and all other stuff. Maybe just about meritocracy and uh, how it was 35 years ago. Um, I'm usually quoting an example of famous uh, Slovenian uh, anthropologist. She left Slovenia some 15 years ago and went to Germany. Uh, she was number one in Slovenia, and she went to work on a small German university. The reason, the reason was that there was no professional, this, uh, no professional context. Uh, there were five anthropologists in Slovenia, and they all knew each other, and there was not possible to establish any kind of uh, regular academic debate discussion, you know, without 
stepping on someone's uh, fingers and so on and so on. Well, maybe that was the, one of the reasons why in Yugoslavia certain things were a little bit different, you know, because you, you had, we had, I, I'm now you know, thinking, uh, you had the so-called key system. The key system was our affirmative action uh, uh, in Yugoslavia. So you had to have a certain number of Albanians, Serbs, Croats, and so on, in, on the local level and on the federal uh, level. And, uh, some uh, segments of the society were promoted. Of course, then the party uh, 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 ID was also helping. You know, but so was it better? Maybe in some segments it was better. Was it different? Very much different. I don't think so. You know, I think that now in the smaller countries you feel or see some of the things more clearly, more visibly. You know. Uh, but that's not helping the development of any of our societies, and that's that's what I had uh, in mind. I, I, I didn't really get um, the part about the multi perspectivity and uh, the different uh, truths. That there are different ways how in different societies or segments of the society see certain uh, historical events. It's, it, it's been always like that, you know? and Poltava twenty. Maybe five years ago wasn't really a problem, now it becomes a, uh, a problem, uh, um, and now it's maybe a state issue or, or important for um, the identity of, of Ukraine. If there is something like that, then teach it in the way they show to the kids that there are problems within the society, that society cannot find really uh, the same narrative uh, about certain events. Show the arguments uh, of different uh, historiographical schools or so on. At some levels, that may be very hard, but the Germans know that uh, from the Beutelsbach uh, uh, definition. Uh, that's what's been suggested in the 70s, and that's what they've been applying ever, ever since. Um, and they are more happy in that way, than, in that sense, than many of our societies.
was uh, cho chosen the other option, but it is general tendency that people are so tired because of renaming the streets, because of changing uh, different uh, historical narratives. They want another thing. They want to uh, repair the uh, street. They want uh, economic growth. They want reforms. And they are the agenda they have proposed is something different, and they don't buy it. So. Um, probably uh, many points to cover, uh, but um, only one thing. Um, I, I um, made presentation on the uh, the day of the memory uh, at the uh, the uh, embassy, Korean embassy in Japan. That the, they made a kind of the documentary film that Italian. Uh, pe uh, people are quite friendly to Jewish people even <coughs> during the time of the fascist regime. And uh, but the uh, I just made comments on this uh, documentary film because uh, it's a kind of the self-justification of Italians that Italians are good people, so just they help. Uh, Jewish people, but the, it, there was a concentration camp uh, in Croatia, uh, the, yeah. and uh, just near that uh, the concentration camp, they made a hotel, uh, and uh, they put the Jewish people in that hotel and protected, and they are proud of it. But uh, just oh, well, a hundred meters. Uh, from that hotel, there is a concentration camp for the Serbian people. So I said that uh, it's nonsense that uh, Italian people are good people and we protect the Jewish. So after that, uh, for about 10 years, I was not invited anymore. <laughs> but um, the, the way of just presenting uh, the memory of the history like this, unfortunately. That is not Italian reports, but also we Japanese also are doing the same thing, and German people as well, and probably uh, the Croatian or Serbian people uh, doing the same. So we have to do, be more conscious about the, how we treat our history by ourselves. And uh, that is a very important thing that uh, the historical uh, documents or historical facts are often uh, utilized by the government. So this, that is a very important point we have to think about. Okay. Thank you. Um, the topic about history is always very difficult to end. I apologize for my mismanagement of time. We are already 10 minutes behind the schedule. Uh, I think coffee uh, break is approaching that. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, you do not mind, please join me to give a big applause for all the presenters. And